to join us. We know your time is hard to come by and we really appreciate you spending it with us. Today I'm joined uh, by Vrakis Blum, Joseph Genders. He's a president and shareholder. He is an expert on job ops, been representing job ops for years and years and Sage 100 and formerly Mass 90, Mass 200. Um, we're also joined by Andrew, Andrew Neal over at Scanco, uh, Matt St. John at Starship, and Patty Benitez at American Payment Solutions. So with that said, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the companies here. Vrakis Blum has been selling and implementing job op software and Sage 100C manufacturing software for over 20 years. They're the all-time sales leader of job ops. Uh, experts in Sage 100 manufacturing. Um, they've been selling and implementing Sage products for over 25 years, and they're one of the top Sage resellers in the Midwest region. Uh, we're also joined by Scanco today, Sage OEM partner and leader in WMS applications for Sage 100 since 1989. And Scanco meets the needs of thousands of distribution and manufacturing companies with a seamlessly integrated real-time warehouse management application with those iOS, Android, and Windows devices out in the warehouse uh, to help automate the pick, pack, and ship process. Also, uh, tracking labor and materials on the manufacturing floor. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how they can do that with their Android and Windows devices, iOS, mobile devices. Uh, we also joined by Starship. They're a Sage Gold development partner. They've been providing integrating <coughs> integrated shipping solutions since 1989. And they have 15 plus years of experience and knowledge in the full uh, spectrum of Sage products. This is in addition to all their established relationships with uh, companies like Scanco and EDI companies like True Commerce, SPS Commerce, um, B2B Gateway. They provide a mature solution that can grow with you. Uh, also, we're joined by American Payment Solutions, and they're a full service merchant solutions provider. They are market share leaders for merchant services in the restaurant, hospitality, and for software companies through the U.S. and Canada. American Payment Solutions uh, serves thousands of small, medium, and large organizations, and they have market share leading integrations with uh, leading ERPs such as Sage 100, Sage 500, Sage X3, Acumatica, a full spectrum of ERPs as well. And here's a little bit about the workflow. We're going to be talking about how an order is taken uh, by a customer service person or maybe placed over the um, internet on an e-commerce portal website. That order comes into Sage 100 and that job ops picks up all the details of the order and uh, provides assembly automation on the manufacturing floor with drag and drop scheduling and all that functionality uh, that a manufacturing company would need. And then uh, that information is sent back into Sage 100 and passed over to Scanco, where Scanco can also track the labor and materials on the uh, production floor with their iOS and Windows handheld uh, mobile devices. And then also it automates the pick and pack in the warehouse for that package. And then all the information is sent over to Starship, where Starship will pick the best carrier based on all the rules of the shipment, where the customer is located, the dimensional weight of the package. All that detail is sent back into Sage 100 with the tracking numbers so that the e-commerce website portal can be updated and Sage 100 can be updated so the customer service people can offer tracking numbers to customers who might be wondering where their shipment is. Email notifications can go straight out to the customer with all the information about their package and then if accounts receivable if it, if the uh, credit card processing is the uh, selected form of payment for that customer then the lowest rate will be provided through level three credit card processing because of all the customer data that American Payment Solutions can extract from Sage 100, it can supply to those credit card processing companies to get the best rate for that particular order 
uh, for credit cards. And so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Joe so he can get us started with uh, talking about job ops. Thank you, Joe. All right. Thanks, Adrian. All right. One of the things that, well, I'm going to cover uh, scheduling and material planning today. But one of the things that I want to start with is, uh, I think is a real strength of job ops, is uh, the different modes of service and manufacturing that you can do. So I have a, a flow chart that, that lays that out. Um, from, order, from Sage's order entry, we could do an, a make to order or an engineer to order type job. And we can create that either from, from scratch, from a blank work ticket. Hopefully, we don't have to just to start that basic. Otherwise, we could have a, a work ticket template, which could make 100% of what we need, or else it could be just something that we edit to make it what we need it to be. Um, if we're doing repeat business, it could be uh, also copied from an open work ticket or a work ticket in history. Many times, maybe you made this item for the first time, don't know if you'll ever make it again. Well, if the customer orders it again, we can simply copy the work ticket from history, which is great. Um, we also have the ability to import from an external source um, and, and create our work ticket from there. So we can handle make to order or engineer to order. Um, big strength of job ops in Sage 100 cloud manufacturing is the product configurator. If you uh, configure items to order, like if you're going to the Dell website to configure a computer, uh, we can do that from Sage's order entry and have a configurable work ticket. Um, configurations can also be saved as templates then, which can make it easier to, uh, if a customer reorders something similar again, or if you have standard configurations that you want to have. Then from order entry, we also have the ability to, um, to do service or installation work. Um, we, from uh, the Sage order entry header, we can launch into a, a service ticket right from there because obviously we're not selling a line item, so it doesn't make sense to add a line item to a sales order. We're able to launch in and create a service ticket, and then whether we're doing a fixed fee or time and materials, the service ticket can actually write back to that order um, how we're going to bill uh, the customer. Um, if we are doing a little bit more, well, the other ways we can do service are obviously the job ops and Sage 100C manufacturing have um, a field service module. So we're able to, from our dispatch board, we could create an on the fly service ticket. So if a customer calls in, if it's a break fix type situation, we're able to pick the customer, what asset we're servicing or enter an asset on the fly, create that service ticket, dispatch it out to the technician. Uh, with the service module, we also have the ability to have preventive maintenance schedules in there. So if we have scheduled maintenance, it'll generate the PM service tickets, which we can then assign to technicians and uh, perform the work. And then we also can do make the stock. So we're able to, from our material planning tool, which I'll be covering <clears throat> a little bit today, we'll be able to generate a make the stock uh, work ticket. So a lot of companies are, are mixed mode manufacturing and maybe they do installation and service. Um, and that was one of the taglines of job ops way back when was make, install, and service. And I think that's one of the, probably the strategic strengths of the product that um, we can take uh, an item all the way through the life cycle or do, do those different uh, types of manufacturing, service, or distribution uh, with a company. So I'm going to cover um, scheduling next. What I'm showing now is the, the current, <clears throat> excuse me, Current job ops scheduling module. Scanco has announced that they will be integrating job pack scheduling software with um, 100C manufacturing. It's not available yet. The release date isn't out. I'm going to be showing the current scheduling. Um, obviously, with the with the new um, job pack, it'll be able even able to do more. So I'm going to start. Where scheduling can start in the software is uh, with. Uh, is in, is in order entry. I have an order that, that someone had entered here. Um, we, we have a promise date on it of, of 3.30. And at this point, we don't really know whether we can make that promise date. However, what we're able to do is, is run a capable to promise calculation uh, during order entry. So if we have a quote in the system or an order, we're able to do a quick and dirty schedule and see when we can get it done. So the promise date is is currently 3.30 and it's telling me, no, we can't quite do it. Based on our labor and material constraints right now, we can't get it done then the earliest we can do it. 
you get it done is by four nine. So if I can, I can choose to accept that if I like. Um, so and it also tells me how it came up with that um, that date. So when I drill into this, it shows all the steps within this work ticket that need to be performed, and it, it, it ran a little schedule of it. And I can see my biggest problem here is this material item. We need this component to perform this operation. We don't have it on hand, so we have to order it, and it's a lead time. So now that I understand this, it's like, well, maybe we can expedite that component, and we can get closer to what the the customer's uh, required date was. So, um, so the next step in the process after getting getting the orders in the system is uh, there's going to be things that aren't scheduled yet. So we have the ability to run a utility to schedule schedule work tickets, um, and I'll just go ahead and do that. So the person in charge of scheduling would do this, and this is the next step in the process that will alert us to whether we have any problems. In this situation, <clears throat> I'm not looking really good. I got three work tickets that are going to be late, so this can be my first indication that I'm going to need to, to go in and, and make some changes in the schedule. So. Um, and, and the way uh, the way things are, are initially put on the schedule, it kind of it looks at the promise date that you want it by, and then it'll backwards schedule. So it kind of spreads out things naturally, so you don't bunch everything up in the front. But if that can't be done, it'll go ahead and forward schedule uh, instead, and uh, then you may or may not make your promise date. So after, oops, that's not the one I wanted to click on. Let's see. So after we do, so after we get things on the schedule, we can now interface uh, with the various scheduling dashboards that we have. The the first view I'm going to go into may not look real exciting, but it's a great way to get a big picture view of where you're at. So I'm going to look at my percent schedule in my work centers going ahead for the next month. So I can see all my peaks and valleys, and this will give me an idea of maybe where um, where I'm going to have problems, but then maybe where I can push things to. And from there, I can drill into a little smaller time frame. I can look at a week at a time and see my peaks and valleys. So if I'm looking here, that the week of the the 10th is really bad in this work center. However, uh, that or, or the, the, that day, the following day, I have plenty of capacity, so I probably can spread that work out, and I should be fine. And from here, I do have the ability to drill deeper into details, seeing what, what work tickets are there. I can actually reschedule from this dashboard also. Um, then the sexy way to look at the schedule is the graphical view. So in this view, and then this can be pulled across multiple monitors. We can make it as big as we want. It's showing me the days of the week across the top. I have my work centers down the side. Um, any gray time, uh, gray, gray areas are unavailable time within the schedule. The white time is available. Then the different uh, bars within there represent the work tickets that are in process. If, the, if it's shaded in green, uh, we're fine and we're, on, and we're, on, we're gonna make our promise date. If it's yellow, we're in danger of becoming late. And if it's red, it is late. And then depending on the different outline colors that the job has, It'll either have uh, a, a, a problem with, with labor, with not having enough capacity to get it done, or the materials aren't going to be available on time, or we could have both. So if I hover over it, it tells me what my problem is, but then I can also drill in and see what my exception is. So here it's telling me my capacity is fine. I have eight hours of capacity. We have eight scheduled. Everything is great there. However, on that step in that work ticket, I, have a, I need a component that we don't, aren't, don't have in stock. Um, so, and I can drill in to inventory from here, uh, the inventory projection and, and see what the, what the actual status of that item is. So there's kind of where labor and material planning intersect and overlap. So I don't have any on hand, don't have any purchase orders out there. I, I'm going negative on this item. That's what's causing me the problem. I also have the ability to look at the entire work ticket. I clicked on all steps. So I not only don't have that item on that step that I need to make this, but on a different step, there's another uh, uh, component item that we don't have available. So I can then take appropriate action to take care of that. Um, we have the ability to do um, uh, 
what if and scheduling, and this is an example how we can do drag and drop too. So if I want to try to move this job up with some earlier available time and may, maybe make it uh, not uh, be late, I can do that and help in that case. And if so, if I don't like what I did during the what if session, I just hit. Uh, oops, I guess I hit yes. I say if I hit no, I would have it would have went back to where I was. So if I go into what if, I drag that somewhere. Don't like it. If I go to exit, what if? Say no. Kind of takes me back to where I was. So we also have an undo, so we can go. We can undo one step at a time if we don't like the way that we reschedule things. So we have the ability here to drill in and see the work ticket a little bit closer. If I go into single work ticket view, I can see all the steps on that work ticket and exactly uh, where they're scheduled. Oops. I have the ability. Uh, I have the ability to click on a work center and it'll just bring up that work center and I can see all the jobs within that work center. I also can click on a day and drill into the daily view and see all the jobs within the day. What's cool about this is I can uh, make multiple discrete selections and, and, and actually reschedule. So if I click on a job and hit begin selection, um, I can click multiple work tickets here, and then I'll click end. And now I can tell it how many days, hours, minutes to move forward or backward, or I can even assign it to a new activity code. So maybe a work center is down. I can I can push it into into a new work center there. So that's another way we can we can reschedule. Um, up on the top view here, it, we can we can look forward uh, far, more weeks into the future. And that can give me an idea of a available capacity that's totally definable by you, exactly uh, what we might want to see there. So that's a quick overview of uh, the labor end of things. Then from material planning standpoint, there's the component exception manager. Now this is also available uh, branded as purchase agent for people who aren't using job ops or 100C manufacturing. So it'll allow you to plan for purchase items and cut purchase orders. Obviously, when you have job ops or 100 cloud manufacturing, we're able to do uh, buys and make items from here. So this allows me to put a cutoff date in. So this is how far in the future do I want to do my material planning? I'm going to just leave it blank, which is infinity. I just have demo data. Pretty important here. It includes lead time. So the lead time to buy something, the lead time to make something will be taken into account and things will get pushed into your planning horizon. So what this does is <clears throat> it's gonna look at every item that we have, what's the quantity on hand, then it's gonna look at what's coming in. We have purchase orders with, with expected receipt dates. We got work tickets that have an expected completion date. Um, then it's gonna look at our demand and our demand can come from a line item on a sales order, a component on a work ticket, um, inventory uh, reorder points and stocking levels that we wanna maintain. And optionally, we can also have it integrate with Sage's MRP module. Um, we don't do that a whole lot, but sometimes it helps if you wanna put a, what, like a forecast in there and, not, and you don't really wanna have it look at hard demand. Without using MRP, it's looking more at, at hard numbers of what you need if you're getting um, like advanced ship notices or whatever, uh, projections from your customers that are going way out many months and you don't necessarily want to create orders for that. Uh, we can push that demand into MRP. We can still see it here, and, and I kind of refer to that as a soft demand, uh, but then we, we won't, won't create any uh, orders or work tickets until the date gets closer because a lot of times uh, customers change their mind on, on what they need, need when, but that's a cool option. So, so after I generate and it calculates what I need, I'm able to uh, usually want to plan your manufactured items first because a, a manufactured item may have a component that is a purchased item. So we usually would come in here and, and generate our work tickets first. Um, I'll show more of the, the features with the purchased item. So here I can, I'll just create, this is totally editable. We can change quantities and that. I'm going to just uh, create this first level of work tickets to show you that we also can handle sub-assemblies. So after I create these work tickets, this this demand for this item comes up because this was an assembly on one of those prior work tickets, and I'm able to uh, then create the work ticket to make that item. 
So we also have the ability to move a make item to a buy and a buy to a make should someone have to, to do that. So now I can look at my purchased items. I'm gonna sort purchase items by vendor, which usually makes sense because that's how you buy it. Um, so you're telling me for Borg, I have a couple items I need to buy. And if I drill into that, I can see here's where my demand's coming from. So I got like seven work tickets that need this item. And then I can drill into inventory and, and see what that projection is, just like I could in, uh, in scheduling when I uh, did, didn't have the item I needed. So as I have 18 on hand, I'm using a whole bunch. I'm, I haven't bought any. And then on, on this date, I'm going to be underwater. So that's why it's alerting me to, to buy it now. And if I look at this other item and uh, dr drill into inventory, you're going to see it's not projecting that I'm going to be out of stock, but it's telling me to buy 20. And that's because we're projected within my planning horizon to be down to a quantity of two. Our reader point is eight and our minimum order quantity is 20. So it's telling me to buy 20. So I can override the quantities here. I can put um, items or, or, or uh, work tickets on hold. I can change the vendor. And when everything's fine, I can simply hit create purchase order and, uh, and launch my purchase orders from here. And just like with the make items, once I satisfy my exceptions, it'll clear off my dashboard. Now, if I uh, go into my last purchase order, we'll see that in Sage, it made a nice purchase order here for those items that I bought. And this scenario, see the first item actually came in as two separate lines, and this one's linked to a work ticket. Uh, we're able to, do, to mix and match uh, buy to order and, and buy to stock together. So the default procurement for this item was buy to stock. However, we overrode it in this instance to buy it specifically for a work ticket. So when we received the goods in, the quantity and cost will go right into the work ticket and not into stock. With these 19 items, those are going to go into stock uh, when we receive it. So, um, so it's a Overview of uh, 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 material planning, which is which is a great tool. Um, what I found really helpful is uh, Business Insights Explorer um, in making customizable dashboards. So I, here's some examples, some of our popular ones. This one I call Job Tracker. So this is bringing in steps on work tickets, and this is more focused on. Uh, on like scheduling and what the status is. So it's showing me what work center it's going through, what the status is, when the, the status was changed, quantity complete, budget and actual hours, uh, when it's scheduled. With that same view, I can take a look at, I've called this one profit tracker. Instead of bringing in job management information, I'm bringing in all the budget and actual information and, and, and revenue and calculating my gross profit. Um, so we're able to do a job analysis this way. So within the software, there's a lot of uh, good views and reports, but when you can customize it to be exactly what you want, uh, sometimes that's more helpful. Here's a way you could make a task list even for a work center. Uh, this is the same view, but it's broken down by work center and it can it kind of be a to-do list for that uh, work center of what work needs to be worked on in, in what order. Um, here's a, uh, Open purchase orders by 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 work ticket essentially. If I there's reports and, and and dashboards to look at this, but a lot of people like to organize information the way they want. So here it's showing me my open purchase order lines with what step on the work ticket it's linked to. Um, I'm grouping it by sales order. I, in my grouping here, I have what's my oldest uh, date, so it's, I can see what my oldest required date is and then I can see the status of the purchase order. So um, all that can be, be really helpful. So hope I gave you some food for thought on, uh, on, on material planning and, and labor planning and some of the things we can do, the strength of job ops with all the different modes of manufacturing and, and service that's available. Um, so if you, we work both with resellers and with end users, so if you, if, if anyone's interested, please reach out to me. I'd be uh, be glad glad to help you. All right. So, Andrew, I, I, oh, you're next. <laughs> all righty. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Right. So my name is Andrew Neal, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you first 
uh, what is our JO scan application and what is JO scan? Uh, JO scan works in conjunction with the job ops uh, 100C Sage Manufacturing. So what we go ahead and do is uh, take the cumbersome efforts of actually uh, tracking the parts that are being issued to the jobs, uh, the labor that is actually being wanted to capture during the jobs, and then obviously uh, doing the make the stock closings to be able to actually put that to finish good inventory. So right off the bat, what I want to go ahead and start off with is, uh, is actually our parts usage. So no more are the days of, you know, issuing a, a ticket out and, you know, some of these jobs might take, you know, a month, it might take two weeks. And in doing so, you're back flushing your material. And so you're not really having a really good idea of real time inventory um, that's actually available for your staff. So what we go ahead and do with this JO scan functionality is be able to issue this in real time to, so that you can have a dynamic inventory and you can have your actual levels of inventory uh, at any given point in time. So uh, what they would typically want to be able to do is go into our parts usage, at which point in time what we're going to go ahead and do is collect who is actually issuing the parts to that job. So I'm going to go ahead and I, I scan in with my employee number here. And then we're going to go ahead and, and as the prompts you can see here, we're going to go ahead and scan our work ticket number and then the item that we're wanting to issue it to that job. Now, what you're gonna go ahead and see here, you're gonna go ahead and see some magnifying glasses that essentially work as drill down boxes. So if you're wanting to pull from different warehouses, you can go ahead and hit this warehouse locator right here, uh, being able to see the quantities on hand for each available warehouse to pull that inventory item from. It's also going to give you some information such as your quantity on hand for where you're pulling the inventory from right now, what is required for that ticket, and what has already been issued out for that ticket. So I'm going to go ahead and you can already see it has a required quantity of two, and then we have an issued quantity of two. So I really don't need to do anything, but for today's purposes, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to issue another two out to this job and hit accept. Very simple. They walk away at that point in time. Now, one of the things that we like to go ahead and also review here is this job ops review dashboard. So just as I was saying before, we have our three primary transactions that day to day we're going to be using and tracking our parts, our labor and our make the stock closing. So if I go into my job ops review dashboard right here, our JO scan review dashboard, and I go to my parts usage, this is going to be a cumulative screen showing not only who is actually issuing these parts, but what work ticket it is assigned to, the sales order, the part, warehouses it's being pulled from. No more guessing games as far as who's doing what at what point in time. You know exactly who to go to and where to go to in the event that there's ever an issue or a discrepancy. So I'm actually gonna go back here and just as we, we issued over the quantity that we wanted to go ahead and do for that job, I'm actually going to go ahead and show right here. Let's go ahead and put this inventory item back into inventory because, hey, you know what? We found out that we went ahead and we overissued that. So I'm going to go ahead and scan in with my employee number. I'm going to go ahead and scan my work ticket again. And now I'm going to go ahead and scan the item that I'm going to want to put back into inventory. Now, as you can see here, we can go ahead and see that the issued quantity is four versus the two that were required. So instead of having to go into Sage and do some cumbersome, you know, uh, inventory adjustments or anything like that, what we can do here is just put a negative symbol with the quantity that we're wanting to put back into the inventory. I can hit accept, walk away. And again, if we go ahead and reference our job ops review dashboard, we'll be able to go ahead and see that we went ahead and we put this item back into our inventory. So if I scroll over, we can go ahead and see that we issued two, but you know what? We actually put those two back into inventory. So we work with lotted items. We work with serialized items. Uh, and in any case, we work with it, um, and you're able to track these parts as they're uh, being issued out onto the work floor to each ticket. So now that we've gone ahead and we've tracked the parts that are actually being issued to each job, now we wanna go ahead and track the labor and the man hours that are going to those jobs. So what we're going to go ahead and do is right here with our labor tracking, we're going to go ahead and dive into that. And with the same simple kind of uh, three-step approach as before, we're going to go ahead and scan in with our employee name. If we don't have like our, our name barcoded or anything, we can use this lookup feature, as I was stating before, to kind of drill down 
see who we who we want to actually uh, do this transaction. So I'll pick our Joe right here. Then we can go ahead, scan the work ticket that we're wanting to actually track the labor with. Now, depending on what step, it's automatically going to know what work center you're in. It's automatically going to populate your start time, and you hit accept and walk away. Very extremely simple. Ten minutes goes by, three hours goes by, it doesn't really matter. What we can go ahead and do is once that job is completed, we would have Joe Worker sign back in. He can go ahead, scan his work order that he has finished. As you can see here, he has autom it automatically populates his end time, and he's going to hit accept and walk away. We also work with indirect labor. We work with crews. So maybe you have a crew of, uh, of employees that are all working on the same job. We can also track crews and be able to dilute the labor across. That way you can get your actuals uh, for each job that way. And in referencing back to our review dashboard here, if we go into our labor tracking, we can go ahead now and see that our Joe worker here he was working on this sales order that was tied to that ticket. We can see what step he was working on. And then as you can see, it's automatically populating his start and end times. So there's a lot of great useful information uh, and not at all cumbersome as you could see there. It was two easy clicks, uh, it scans I should say. It goes ahead, grabs this information at which point in time it could be imported into Sage. That way you have all of your information in one spot. So, and then the same way works is if we wanted to go ahead and do a make the stock closing, we can go ahead and do here, use our drill down box. We can go ahead and see what type of tickets we want to go ahead and do our closing with. We, we can go ahead and put in our quantities. If we need to print labels, we can go ahead and print labels. We hit accept and walk away. So there's a lot of functionality in, in being able to actually scan these tickets as they're uh, being incorporated through the assembly line or through the actual work ticket life cycle and being able to gather all that very uh, information that's valuable but also being able to do it quickly without losing any kind of production time or anything like that so now that we've gone ahead and, and let's just go ahead and say that we've created our item now now I'm, what i'm going to actually go ahead and do is show you how we're going to actually pick pack and ship our item so I'm going to go ahead and close this here. And on my left-hand side, I have my Sage. And then on my right-hand side, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to bring up my Linea Pro scanner. Now, the warehouse application that ScanCo uses can be used on any iOS or Android device. And so as you can see here, this is like an Apple device. Uh, if you go to the, the Google Play Store or the Apple uh, App Store, you can go ahead and download our product right there. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is right here on the bottom, I have my ScanCo Warehouse 100 application. I'm going to go ahead and hit that, at which point in time, it's going to go ahead and bring me into a login screen. And it's really good to note that we work off of a system that um, you can have different user profiles. You can go ahead and share devices. So in the event that we, you have a bunch of different shipping guys that are sharing a device, they can grab a device. They can go ahead and scan in with their login information. And as that loads up, we also work in with different company codes. So if you have different company codes that you're wanting to work within, this would be the time to go ahead and pick that company code. So now that we go here into our home screen, so we have our, I've already created a sales order. So what we're gonna go ahead and do in step-by-step step is actually pick this order. We're gonna put it into a staging order and then we're gonna go ahead and put in and ship it out. So we're gonna go ahead and right here on the bottom uh, left-hand corner here, we have our picking tab. I'm gonna go ahead and do that and do my order picking. So we're gonna go ahead and pick warehouse 000. And now it's gonna go ahead and prompt me with how many lines are on the actual order, how many lines are in that actual warehouse and how many that are left to pick. So I'm gonna just go ahead and say, okay. At which point in time, it's gonna go ahead and direct me with what item I should be picking. So as we can see here, I've already uh, typed in the sales order that I'm wanting to pick. It's gonna direct me to bin A10L, in which I wanna scan item 6655. It's gonna go ahead and give me an item description of what that item is. 
the the unit of measure. That way I know what I'm actually picking, whether that be a single item, a box, or a case maybe. And so what we can go ahead and see now is there's a quantity to pick versus the quantity that has been picked. So I'm gonna go ahead, as you can see here, it says item. So I'm gonna wanna go ahead and scan this item. Now for today's purposes, I'm also gonna show how this is a validating step. So I'm gonna go ahead and scan item, uh, the wrong item here. And as you can see here, it's validating the fact that this isn't, you're not scanning the right item, you're not picking the right item. So please scan item 6655. So what I'll go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and scan my 6655 now at which point in time now I can enter in the quantity that I'm picking. And then it's gonna direct me to my next item. So again, now I'm gonna to go to A10L and I'm gonna scan item 8971. So I'll go ahead and scan my 8971. Now this is gonna be a lotted item just to show you how we can work with different items. If you've already gone ahead and captured your lots that are in Sage, what you can go ahead and do, just like in the magnifying glasses before, we can go ahead and use this drill down box to go ahead and see what lots we have available with its quantity. So I'll go ahead and say, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and pick this lot, and I'm gonna go ahead and pick all 10 that are required for this order. Once you've gone ahead and collected and picked ev everything that's on that order, it's gonna go ahead and let you know that do you wanna submit it for processing, in which you're gonna say yes. So at this point in time, We've gone ahead, and as you can see here, we picked this to a staging area. So we're gonna go out back now, and now our shipping crew is gonna go ahead and box this up, and we're gonna go ahead and ship this out. So I'm gonna go ahead with our shipping truck that's right here in the middle. I'm gonna select that icon. I'm gonna hit my shipping truck. I'm gonna take the next available batch that's in Sage. If you have different shipper IDs that you wanna go ahead and identify yourself with, you can go ahead and do so there. We'll go ahead and we can do a lookup to see all the available sales orders that are in Sage. Or if you have your sales orders already barcoded, you could simply barcode your sales order that you're wanting to ship out. The next field is gonna go ahead and say, okay, you're gonna go ahead and start with box one. So I'm okay with starting with box one. And now we wanna go ahead and start packing our items. If we use our lookup feature, we can go ahead and see all of the available items that I'm gonna to need to go ahead and pack up. So I'm gonna go ahead and select 6655, and we're gonna go ahead and pack all of that item into the first box, and then what we're gonna go ahead and do is put the lotted item into the second box. So as you can go ahead and see here, it's actually knowing that we've already allocated it and we put this in the staging area, so it's pulling it from the staging area, and we're gonna go ahead and pack all 20 of this item into the box. So now we've gone ahead, our box is full. Now we wanna go ahead, we wanna create a new box. So we're gonna hit this uh, little option feature that we have on the top right. And I, as you can see right down here, we have a next box feature. Once we hit that next box feature, you're gonna see the box level detail turn to two. So now I can go ahead, scan the remaining item that I need to go ahead and put back into the box. We can go ahead, it's gonna go ahead and ask us for our lot information. If we go ahead and do our lookup to see the available lots, we can go ahead and see that this one's green because we had gone ahead and chosen that. That has been allocated to this order. So we, it's easily uh, notable that we wanna go ahead and use this lot for this order. At which point in time, we're gonna enter in the quantity that we're actually shipping out. And then once you're gone ahead and done, we can go ahead and do our review. There's no unresolved line items, at which point in time, we're gonna go ahead, hit our option feature, and send this to Sage. Once that's done successfully, I'm gonna go ahead and go into my Sage now. We're gonna go into our shipping data entry. We're gonna look at the latest batch that had gone ahead and came out of Sage. Let me go ahead and bring this down here. And then we'll be able to see that this has automatically been imported into Sage right here from the handheld. So no more of uh, you know writing on the pack, packing slip, sending it into the office to be input. The second that you've gone ahead and put that into, into uh, as sending it into Sage, we can go ahead and see right from here, the package level detail. So we can see 8971 is in box two. 
we can see pack, the first package, uh, 6655, is in box one. And then it's also capturing all of our distribution tables. So it, it goes ahead and says, you know what, you pulled the lot number 101, you pulled it from the staging area, any kind of referencing, we've gone ahead and collected that from the device and it has been imported into Stage. So now that it's gone ahead and been input into the shipping data entry, this is where Starship will go ahead and take over and be able to do uh, any kind of, uh, of the shipping uh, integrations that they need to do. So Matt, you ready? Yep, I'm all set. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, let me get my screen shared here. Share the right screen. Okay, so on my screen, I have the Starship software. Uh, today I'm gonna to be showing you our direct integration um, to Sage. Nice thing with the direct integration is your shipper can actually just work and stay right inside a Starship. Uh, as you saw that Scanco is going to create that entry inside shipping data entry. Um, so instead of going in there, jumping from there into Starship and then back to shipping data entry, uh, they can actually work right from the Starship program and not have to worry about going into Sage. Uh, so upper left-hand side, um, I have my source document. So I am going to put in that sales order number that we are going to ship. Um, if our pick tickets are barcoded, probably are if we're using Scanco solution, I can have a just a regular wedge type scanner hooked up to my shipping station and I can just scan that barcode. We also have a lookup or if I need to I can manually type in that sales order number. And as soon as I type in that number what Starship is doing is just reaching into Sage and grabbing all that shipping information. Okay, so on my shipping tab here um, as you can see carrier service billing type and account number has been selected. So we just simply map fields from Sage as you can see those map fields can be a one-to-many relationship. So just based off that ship via on this order, it's automatically selecting my carrier service billing and account. Uh, so Starship can also, if you're doing collect or third-party shipments, we can easily help automate those shipments as well. Okay. Um, Sender Company is the company the order is coming from, from Sage. Uh, we do support multiple companies as well as multiple locations and or warehouses. And the recipient address, that of course is the ship to from that order. Um, down in the packaging view is my item to box detail. Uh, so I'm just gonna expand my items. Um, so however I define my shipment on the handheld device, so as Andrew defined that shipment, that's how Starship is going to pull in that information. So you can see I have the two boxes, one box with the uh, item 6655 and the second box with item number 8971. Um, on the box tab here and under packaging, um, if you have standard boxes, bags, bales, pallets, what have you, you can actually set those up and store them inside Starship. Um, so nice thing with that, you know, maybe this item I know goes in a medium box. Starship will automatically populate the dimensions for you. Um, if you have a scale hooked up to your shipping workstation, we integrate with most scale, so we can automatically return weights. Uh, my system, I don't have a scale, so I'm just using the weights that are set up inside a Sage from item maintenance. Okay. Um, line item detail, what Starship will also do is start storing your inventory items. Um, you know, if you'd like, we can have that database. Nice thing with that is, you know, this order happens to be international, so Starship also tied to that inventory item has its own database for the international required information such as Schedule B or harmonized codes. As you can see, country of manufacturer, uh, EEI classification, if I need a certificate of origin, all that's gonna be stored right with inside of Starship. Another thing Starship's gonna do is when I bring in an order, it will do address validation. Um, so we actually make the call to the carrier's web services and make sure that address is valid. We'll alert alert your shipper so they can make the change. You know, just a way to help save save you money. You know, you're not going to get hit with those address correction fees. All right. So I'm going to bring that in. I got my custom boxes, my Schedule B, my international information. You can also store freight information if you're doing an LTL shipment. Um, and now, if I want, my shipper can actually rate shop. So they can do that. They can either click this green dollar icon or they can go to the rate shop tab here. Uh, we also offer, put this 
standard feature will add a rate shop button right inside a sales order entry. So if you want, your customer service reps can actually rate shop at time of order. Uh, what Starship does, we actually make the call. So we're going to use your account information and make the call directly to your carriers. Uh, so as you can see here, UPS, FedEx, I have set up. And we're going to turn you, return your live negotiated rates that you have with the carrier. Uh, so here I can see estimated delivery date. I can see total days, estimated delivery. I can see contract. Or if I want to, I can actually just see my list or the list, published list rates. Uh, with this, we can also set up ship via rules. Uh, so if you want Starship to automatically select the carrier service based off your own criteria, you can most certainly do that. Um, you know, my shipper can actually make a change here, or again, Starship can automatically do that. On the charges tab, shipper doesn't necessarily have to go to this tab, but I just like to show it uh, because Starship also allows you to set up freight rules. So freight rules can be percentages, they can be min maxes, it could be a flat rate. Um, it could be based off of, say, line item detail. So maybe if I have an oversized item, say item one, two, three, four, I can do a rule that says, hey, anytime item one, two, three, four is on an order, automatically add $20 because it's an oversized item. Um, here, I actually have a freight rule set up. I'm using a user defined field that I've set up in, in Sage. Uh, this is actually lives in customer maintenance. It's called freight discount. It's just a checkbox. So because it's selected, this customer is receiving a 10% discount on this order. All right. Um, so after a rate shop, when my shipper is ready to ship and process, they can simply click the ship and process button or F5 is the shortcut key. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ship and process. From there, I will get all my shipping documents. You know, normally, these will just print right out, uh, but for the sake of the demo, we'll preview them. Um, also, for the sake of the demo, I'm using this as our smart label. And as you can see, the smart label prints the shipping label and the packaging list together on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So this would go to a laser printer. Uh, most certainly you can send your shipping label to a thermal printer. And if you like, we also give you the option if you want to send that packaging list to a thermal printer, you can do that as well. So maybe you wanna save some paper, use those free labels you get from your carrier. Right. So I got box one, box two. Uh, because this is an international, I can actually have Starship print all my international documents. And same thing for an LTL shipment. Um, I can actually get bill lading forms, kind of all my required uh, LTL shipment documents. So commercial invoice, um, my NAFTA form. With our documents, you can actually customize them. So a lot of clients will do, you know, we work with them, we'll do a signature, we'll have it name, date, company, title, you know, kind of all these standard fields already filled out. So if I do need to print these out, you know, my shipper not, is not going to have to take the time and actually, you know, manually fill out these fields. Okay, again, we're pulling order header, line item detail, so all that information will populate on these documents. And then I think I also have a shipper's letter of instruction here. Um, it's up to you. You know, if you don't need a shipper's letter of instruction, you don't need to print it. Um, if you need, uh, say, a commercial invoice to look a certain way for, a, say, a certain customer, uh, you can also customize the templates and then assign printing rules um, for each template. Right. So my shipper ships and process, they get their shipping labels. For them, they're kind of rinse repeat cycle now. They're ready to move on to their next order. Um, inside of Sage for the front office, I'm going to jump into invoice data entry here. And we'll bring up that invoice for this shipment for sa uh, sales order 40117. Go to my last invoice here. Sales order 40117. On my header tab, if I click on the tracking button, okay, so what Starship's doing is writing all that tracking and shipping information right inside of Sage. Um, this is living going to go into their tracking tables, um, so it will flow through into history. So at a later date, I can go through customer maintenance or invoice history lookup and have access to this information. So I can track, this is Sage's built-in tracking button, um, and this is even their item to box detail. So again, at a later time, I can look up this information right from Sage. Totals tab, we are writing back the freight amount, okay? And that includes, or does not include freight rules. Um, we cannot write back freight. You know, maybe you offer certain customers free freight. Um, and also down underneath this, I have this freight cost from Starship field. This is actually another user-defined field that I created. I'm just kind of showing you the flexibility of how Starship can actually pass, you know, other information into either custom fields or standard Sage fields. Um, so this, I'm always passing what this 
freight is going to, you know, what the carrier is going to charge me. Um, so, you know, with this invoice, if someone's going through, you know, they can use this as kind of a double default here and say, oh, you know what, our charge is $45. You know, why are we charging them 41 Oh, they got a discount. Yeah, they shouldn't have received that. So let's charge them $50. Okay, so this freight amount field, you can adjust it. And then I can just simply click accept. Uh, really quick, also included with Starship um, is our e-notification program. So here's our e-notify e email viewer. I'm just going to log back in here. And we'll be able to see the template that I have designed for my shipment. So under pending, let me go here. We'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, unlimited templates. These templates are very easy to design. Um, nice thing with these, instead of, you know, if you're using UPS or FedEx, you know, UPS, the Quantum View email, it's kind of branded UPS. Nice thing, you can use your company logo, build your brand awareness. Um, but as you can see, company logo, let my customer know, hey, your shipment's on its way. You know, easily can link in Sage Field. So I have PO number, you know, sales order number, let them know how it's being shipped. Of course, where it's going to, number of packages, delivery date that's coming from the carrier. So it is accurate. And of course, if I wanted to, I can show them that item to box detail with the hyperlink tracking numbers. Okay, so send these to your customers, you know, let them track those packages, you know, hopefully help reduce those inbound calls of customers looking for their shipment. On these templates, if you want, you know, you can include coupon codes. You know, here I have 20% promo. On the coupon code, you can hyperlink it to get them right back to your website. And with the templates, you can also do emailing or sending rules. Uh, so maybe, you know, if you have, say, gold customers set up and you only want this promo code to go to your gold customers, you can most certainly set that up as a, as a um, criteria. Okay. These can be sent as soon as we ship and process. You can delay them by a certain number of hours and or minutes, um, or you can set them to go at the end of the day at, you know, say, 6 o'clock in one big batch. And also included with Starship is our dashboard program. A nice thing with dashboard, you know, it doesn't require any additional users or licenses. It can be installed in as many workstations as you'd like. Uh, so the front office can use this. Here I just have some performance indicators up here. As you can see, shipment by status, by carrier, by user. You know, with Starship, you can have your shippers have their own logins with their own security features, roles, uh, top five customers. Uh, with each of these widgets, you know, I can drill down further. So maybe I wanted to track a certain package. I can most certainly drill right down into it and actually get this shipment record detail screen. Um, as you can see, it can see shipping date, estimated delivery, kind of all the standard shipping information. Um, we also include a couple canned reports, a late delivery report that will actually go out, compare a guaranteed delivery date to the actual delivery date, let you know if any package wasn't delivered on time. So you can contact your carrier, try to get a refund. And then we have a charge comparison report. This report's great. It's going to go out, show you all your shipments, uh, show you the applied. So that's what you charge the customer for the shipment, and then compare it to your contract rate. And third column is going to be the plus or minus. Nice way to make sure you know, you're not losing money on your shipments. Okay. Uh, that's really what I wanted to show you. Um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time out of the day for the webinar. And with that, we'll pass it over to Patty so you can see how you're going to be able to capture those funds from your orders. Thank you, Matt, and um, everyone that's been on the presentation. It has been very, very informative. And definitely um, the question is, where exactly does credit card processing blend in to this phenomenal uh, integration and um, all of the different products that have been presented today? We're automating not only the fulfillment and manufacturing process, the pick, pack, and ship, but ultimately, we would like you to get paid for all of your efforts. And we would like your customers to have an easy way to pay you while at the same time providing you with the lowest rates available in the industry. So let's start talking about how to obtain the very lowest rates available. If you're processing any business to business or business to government transactions, there's a program called Level 3, which we have completely automated and fully integrated into Stage 100 that provides Visa and MasterCard with several required fields that you see on the screen. And in exchange, Visa and MasterCard offer to cut the rate in half and sometimes even more than half. So let's just say the current rate is 2.65.
simply by providing Visa and MasterCard. The fields you see on the screen, the rate will go down to 1.65 for any business to business or business to government transaction. So we start there. We also provide our services, installation, setup, maintenance, support at no charge with the level three, 12 hour funding, American Express, a migration utility from Sage. So if ever you would like to get an idea of how much you, you can potentially save through level three processing, we can provide you with the free audit. And not only that, if you decide to make the switch, you won't have to manually enter all of your credit cards into Sage, we will migrate them for you. Just wanted to show you a quick example of how much of a savings our average merchant obtains once we audit their existing credit card processing rates and fees. Now, here's how I think we could help you the best. So we're eliminating the double data that you'd have to enter into Sage. Once you've invoiced the items and of course shipped them out, you're ready to get paid. What's the quickest way? We have a new enhancement that's included with our standard uh, integration into Sage called cut to pay It's very, very convenient, easy as one, two, three, and secure. It's available for all of our one, Sage 100 merchants currently, very simple to use. Basically, through paperless office, you're able to send out an email with the attached invoice. Your customer is able to click on that invoice, and there is a Pay Now button. Once they submit their payment with the Pay Now button, all of this information flows back into Sage 100 accounts receivable for you. So it's, it's very fast, again, very secure. And most of all, you will be able to stand out from the crowd because you will be the only one to send not just your shipments, but your invoice with a very convenient pay now button. It's very simple to set up, available as of version 2013 and above. You must be processing with American Payment Solutions and have paperless office turned on. And you can see on the screen right now, it is not something that all of your customers have to be set up to do. You can actually have them opt out so you pick and choose which customers will be receiving the click to pay functionality. And as you can see on the screen, a very simple invoice with a pay now button. Once they click on that button, they will be able to see a pay invoice screen. They will be able to select a payment. They can either pay the full amount or pay a custom amount. And once that payment is submitted, as I mentioned, the information will flow back into accounts receivable cash receipts where you can actually continue with your end of day process and we take care of the rest. All while we're getting you the level three information, sending it to Visa MasterCard on your behalf and guaranteeing the best rates available. Click to pay is the most popular enhancement. Um, it's been requested by many merchants and you, you will now have it at no charge once you make the switch to American Payment Solutions. Uh, that's really all I wanted to present. I wanna be very respectful of everybody's time. I do want to mention that we will be attending SAGE sessions in Chicago on April 23rd and 24th, and we would love to invite you to our happy hour, which